So welcome, I'm Melissa Jones with uh, the Bay Area Health Inequities Initiative, Bar High. Uh, we are the coalition, yes, thank you, Will. <laughs> I'm joined by a number of our team here today who have been big parts of, of Rise Together and excited about the work that's happening here uh, with all of you. And about two years ago, the coalition of the Bay Area's public health departments took a very close look at the connection between economic opportunity and health. Uh, and with an eye to the whole region, really looking at what's happened um, in the jobs that we've, we've added over the last 10 years. Um, and one of the things that we see is even with all the addition of jobs, and particularly here uh, in the South Bay where we've seen a lot of addition of high wage jobs, still a third of the jobs in our region are, are not paying a living wage, right? And so we've been thinking a lot about the connections of that for health. Um, and we have two people here today who can really help lay the landscape for us of um, where we are now in terms of, of equity in, in the Bay Area. And so we will have two brief presentations, followed by an opportunity for a substantial number of conversation and questions. So sh shall we get started? I'm Sarah Truhaft. I am a managing director at PolicyLink, and I am very happy and very excited to be here with you today to share with you a coming website um, that is a data support system for the region and for community leaders like you in the region that is called the Bay Area Equity Atlas. So today I'm going to be giving you a preview of it. This website will be launched on June 5th. So you are you know, the first large group to see it. We've been developing it for couple years now. And uh, my friend Chirag, new friend Chirag over there is going to help me to do a bit of a live demo for you. But first I'm going to share with, introduce you to the project and then we'll go online and you'll see one indicator um, that's contained in this atlas and then we'll go back to the presentation. So this project, the Bay Area Equity Atlas, started with the San Francisco Foundation adopting an equity framework. When Fred Blackwell took over as the CEO of the foundation about five years ago, and they knew that they wanted to, they knew the importance of data, data that is deeply disaggregated by race, ethnicity, nativity, ancestry, gender, right? They knew that that data was really critical to advancing their equity agenda. And so they partnered with us at, at PolicyLink, we have a partnership, a National Equity Atlas partnership. I don't know if anybody has seen that tool that provides data for the nation and for communities across the country. We have this partnership with a university-based partner, the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at the University of Southern California. It is a research institute led by Dr. Manuel Pastor. And we have been partnering to provide this sort of data and a narrative about how and why equity matters to our collective future. And so Fred Blackwell, taking over at the San Francisco Foundation, um, wanted to embrace this equity framework and launch it. And new data was critical, so partnered with us to inform it with data. Then they also went out and did listening sessions with community leaders like yourselves in all of the, the five counties of their service area, um, and then a little bit beyond, but in listen to what do, what do people that are working for change on the ground really need, and they express this need for data. That there are, you know, there are, Bar High produce, produces data, um, your shop, Steve, has produced great data on the Opportunity Index, but they felt like there was still a need for more, more data, and so they asked us to solve this problem of providing data to folks working in the region. I'm gonna go here. Uh, and so, so the Bay Area Equity Atlas is really working to provide disaggregated data as a decision support system and support for advocates um, as Ellen Wu of Urban Habitat described it, she said that data is democratizing power, right? So we're trying to disaggregate data to provide the data that people need to describe the challenges and to coalesce people around solutions to people at scale. Also about providing a shared narrative around how and why equity matters for the Bay Area, how it's important to people who are being left behind, of course, and it's important for our region as a whole. 
We want to elevate equity in the public debate, have more people understanding what equity is and why they should work toward it. And we want to provide hands-on support to equity campaign leaders and folks that are working on the ground for change. And so those are the goals of the Equity Atlas. We thought the practice of creating a data tool like this matters. And so we wanted to design a tool that meets the needs of advocates. And so we assembled an equity campaign leaders advisory committee that includes you know, several organizations, eBase, Working Partnerships, Urban Habitat, Bay Rising, groups that are working for change and working on equity campaigns, and talk to them about what they needed and what sort of indicators would be useful and what sort of support they needed. So they really helped to drive the development of this tool. Also unique about the Bay Area Equity Atlas is building on the San Francisco Foundation's equity framework, which is around people, place, and power. You're going to see that in a minute. And also providing not just the data, but this is a lesson that we had learned with the National Equity Atlas, is that we want to provide data with a story, with a narrative, and we want to provide data and strategies. OK, so we know that 80% of people who are economically insecure pay too much for housing, what can we do about it? So we want to provide people with the policy strategies, the know-how to know what to do with it. So I want to share with you the site. I'm going to, I'm going to go here, and then I'll go to Chirag. Um, so first, oops, sorry, I'm having a little, oh, there we go. All right, so this is what you will see on the home page. I'm just going to show you a few slides here where you see the people, place, oops, sorry, and power. <laughs> I must be pointing this at the wrong place. Okay. Um, Power is hard to build, but worth the time. <laughs> hard, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, now let's go. To, I want to show you an indicator on the system. So, Chirag, let's see if that works to pull it up live. And the indicator that we are going to show you, so the, the Bay Area Equity Atlas includes 21 indicators, and this is, this is great, yeah, if you can just stay there for one second. 21 indicators, and they are across the people, place, and power framework. These indicators, a lot of them are drawing from national data sets, but also drawing from local data sets, and some data sets that we actually created ourselves. So under power, that is an area that was, <coughs> that is often unrepresented in data. And one of the power indicators that I have a slide on, if that starts working, um, is the diversity of elected officials. So we actually collected that data ourselves and we'll be updating that every year. And so this just gives you a sense of the breadth of the data across the indicator areas. And if we go, now we click on housing burden. All right. Okay, great, it's working. <laughs> and if you go to right full screen, so now we're looking at the trends in housing burden in the nine county Bay Area compared to California. And so what you see is this tremendous growth. As we know, we have a housing affordability crisis that's hitting renters and renters of color in particular, right? But you see this tremendous growth, but you also see that the Bay Area is less burdened than California as a whole, which might be you know, surprising to you at first, but it's, it has to do with the income mix of renters in California. So, so that's one, one insight there. Um, and then if you, I wanna just show you what's available in this tool. So if you go down to the breakdown by race, So you can see, you can break down the data by race and you see that Native Americans in the Bay Area, black people in the Bay Area, and Latinos, renters in the Bay Area are most burdened. And if you go by gender, the next breakdown, you further see that it is households that are led by women of color, really, that are burdened which is something that we've heard about through the research, right? Matthew Desmond's book, Evic book Evicted, showed that challenge. And 
And if you go to by ancestry, we also know that it is really critical to break down the broad racial ethnic groups further. That was one critique of the National Equity Atlas when we first launched in 2014 was how could you not break down the Asian or Pacific Islander population further? And we did do that, and so we do that for the Bay Area Equity Atlas where you see groups by ancestry, you know, who is burdened and who is not. You see a lot of diversity in the Asian or Pacific Islander population, for example. If you could just scroll through and show the, some of the groups that are highest there. So we, we have, I can't. Uh, hopefully you can read that text, <laughs> but um, sub people from Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle Easterners, Vietnamese population. And another breakdown we want to show you is by poverty. So we saw that it's people, renters of color, especially women who are more burdened. This is showing you if you can scroll over each bar to show the, the mouse over. Maybe that's... That this is showing you the, the left, the red bar, is below people who are living at below 200% of poverty, which is about 48,000 per year for a family of four. And then it goes to the middle bar, 200 to 350% of poverty, and then above 350% of poverty. So you're really seeing here that this is about income. And so a lot of the reason why women of color are more renter burdened is because of their incomes, which connects to a lot of what Carmen was talking about, right? And so this is just to show you, uh, give you a sense of what you will find for the geographies in the Bay Area Ac Equity Atlas, all nine counties, both the nine county and the five county region, and the large cities, and then all cities, and then the census designated places. So a total of 272 geographies. Not every data point will be disaggregated for every place because it's, it's a numbers game in terms of the ability to break it down, but we do it as much as we possibly can. And I wanna scroll down on this page and show you what else you will get in addition to the data. So an explanation of what are the drivers of this? What are, why do we see these differences by race? Talking about some of the issues around structural racism, institutional racism, and how it's embedded in our policies. We also wanna share solutions. So we share, um, th this is showing you about the rent control measure which passed in Richmond a couple years back. And then stories about people who are either impacted by the issues, working to change them. This is a story of Evangelina Lara, who lives in a rent-controlled apartment in East Oakland. And that apartment building was bought by a corporate landlord who sought to illegally evict all the tenants. They received some support from Casa Justa, Just Cause. And she's able to stay in her home. And she talks about how that's so valuable for her to be in that home for 20 years, the stability it's offered her and her children. And then the last part is resources and then related indicators so you can continue to explore. Um, one interesting data point, we're not going to go there now. This has worked successfully. Thank you, Sharad. Uh, if you could switch back to the, the PowerPoint. Um, so the one related indicator is how much would renters gain if they did not have rent burdens? And one unbelievable data point I find, if renters who were at 200% of poverty or below were not rent burdened, they could have $9,900 more per year. $9,900. So that's, you know, tuition at San Jose State University. That's all your transportation costs. That's almost all your childcare costs. So this is, it really is um, holding people back from participating fully in the economy. So if uh, I'm gonna go to, let me see if my clicker works, okay. I'm just gonna click, do you have control of this that you could flip through a couple for me? Sorry, this is tricky to, yeah. Keep going to diversity of electeds. Okay, there, back. Thank you. So um, the, the novel data that we collected, the di diversity of electeds, this is a picture of it for the nine county region. I don't know how easy it is for you guys to read these numbers, but I think you can see that the, the, the general difference here, differences here, I'm gonna share with you some of the data points. So 40% of our population in the region is white. 
74% of electeds in the region are white. So huge, huge overrepresentation of white people in elected positions, positions of power making our laws. The next, the, the next category, oh, not the next slide. <laughs> I'm still explaining this one. The, um, the next category is the black population. So obviously we know, we know that the black population in the region has shrunk because of displacement. So it's just 6% of our population now. It used to be 12% or so um, years back, a few, few decades back. But the, the, about 6% of the electeds are black and about 6% of the population. But when you look at the next two categories of Latinos and then Asians, you see this tremendous lack of representation in terms of elected officials, where Latinos represent 24% of the population, but only 9% of electeds. And among Asian or Pacific Islanders, 26% of the population, but only 10% of electeds. And when you look further by gender, which we do, um, let Latinas um, are, are the least represented among groups. And so this is obviously representation is not the only thing that matters in terms of moving forward in equity agenda. Your, your politics matter too, but it, it does matter in terms of having your population represented and bringing the experiences um, into, into, your, in, into politics. So that's one other, and then I just wanna show one more thing and then um, I, I have maybe two more things and then we'll go to Stephen, just making sure I'm okay on time. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Voting is another one of our power indicators. And what I wanted to share with you here is our mapping functionality through slides. So it's, it's more dynamic when you're on the site. But this is showing registration by census tract, voting registration in the Bay Area. And then the next slide you're going to get is voting. So if you could toggle between these slides, so voting, the lighter color is lower, and the darker color, the blue, is higher, right? And if you could go back and forth a little bit to show folks. See, so you can see registration versus voting. And then if you go to the next slide, what we're able to do is then filter the map by demographics of places. So here you're looking, if you're particularly interested in, okay, well, what does voting look like in communities that have a larger share of black people in them, of a black population? So this is a filter, and you're looking at areas that have a higher black population, and then you can toggle between these to look at voting and registration to understand what, what it looks like in different communities. Uh, the next one, yeah. So, so some variation there, where some are still high voting, high registration, some are high voting, uh, low registration, I'm sorry, the reverse, high registration, low voting, and some are high, high registration, high voting. All right, next slide. So that gives you a sense of our indicators and the power of this website, which it'll be released June 5th. What are people doing with this? So one of our, Something that we've been doing as we've been building this is working with the equity campaign leaders to integrate data into their work. And so when we worked with the Raise the Roof Coalition in Concord, which is run by eBase, to help them use data to in their housing justice work in Concord. So we shared data and looked at, uh, well, can renters afford median market rent in, in neighborhoods in Concord? And what we found was that most renters are earning less than 50000 per year, and there are no neighborhoods where rent is available to them, no, no neighborhoods at all. Most of the neighborhoods, you have to have at least $75,000 income per year, but only one in four renters earn that much. And so they use that in their report, and if you can go to the next slide and kind of click through the slides. <laughs> um, they used that data in their report. It got tremendous media coverage, so really helped to punctuate, oh, there's one, punctuate their um, advocacy and, and got covered in the media. And then next slide, please. And then we've also worked with Urban Habitat has a project helping grassroots coalitions in South Alameda County to advance tenant protections and renter justice campaigns. And so we created fact sheets to support those efforts in Fremont, in Hayward, and in Union City. And 
And so the, we worked with them to create these fact sheets to look at the issues, and this helps them to engage youth in, in Hayward, for example. It's really helped them to engage youth in the campaign, and then also to go and talk to policymakers about the, their solutions. And in Hayward, it has actually resulted in a win where they extended just cause eviction to more renters in that city. So this gives you a sense of how actually the data can then translate into more power for advocates working on the ground. These grassroots groups often just don't have the research capacity to gather the data, to do the analysis, to create the visualizations. And so our team is able to produce those for them so that they can do what they're um, great at in terms of going and advocating and organizing people for change. So I will stop there and sharing that preview of the site. I'm excited for you all to be able to play with it, to explore it, and hopefully use it in your work. And look forward to the questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, on, you each have uh, index cards on your table, so if you have questions for Sarah and want to start writing them down now, please do. And Stephen, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. First of all, I want to thank Megan for inviting me here, not only because I can speak to you all, but also because I can actually get in. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to get a registration to this event, so thank you for actually uh, inviting me to speak so that I could be here. Um, let's test this to make sure this works. I think I'm supposed to point at the projector. Let's try that. Okay, it works. Okay. Um, following Sarah's fantastic, I'm looking forward to diving into the Equity Atlas, the new one that's launching, but following that, it's worth remembering that in many respects, we're the epicenter of inequality. California is in the middle of the pack in terms of states that have levels of poverty, but when you add in housing costs with the supplemental poverty measure, we vault to number one in the country. So we're one of the, we're, we're have a reputation as you know the leader of the resistance. Yet this is one of the most unequal states in the country, if not the most unequal, and a region, the Bay Area, that is one of the most unequal, if not the most unequal in the entire world, if not the country. Yet one of the paradoxes is that we're also one of the most diverse, and we have this overwhelming commitment, at least among people like this, I look out in this large room, to equity. Everywhere I go, there are organizations dotted across the Bay Area in all nine counties and beyond. I'm actually convinced the Bay Area is now a 12 county region, not nine counties, so maybe we should even be a little bit bigger. Uh, but how can we make sense of that and what can we do? A couple of years ago, uh, we worked, at, I should say I'm the assistant director and director of research at the Haas Institute for, the fair and, for a Fair and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley. God, that's a mouthful. We just had our Othering and Belonging Conference a month ago, maybe a few, some of you were there. But a few years ago, we co-wrote a report with the Insight Center, and Ann Price, who's the head of the Insight Center, is here. We looked at four different policy interventions, including renting, rental subsidies, minimum wage subsidies, so on and so forth, to try and see what would actually make a difference in the Bay Area for workers and residents. And the result of our study, we used the self-sufficiency index, which many of you might be familiar with, Urban uh, Institute helped co-create that. We ran four interventions. And we looked at each of these interventions, almost none of them came anywhere close to getting people to actually self-sufficiency. Minimum wage, $15, not even close. Uh, rental subsidies, not even close. The, the problem is so deep here in the Bay Area, it's, it's so entrenched and so systemic that no single policy alone can actually get us close to equity. So uh, I'm gonna be a little bit of a harbinger of bad news here. Um, so just de deal with, I hope you can, you can deal with that. This week is 62 years since the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, UCLA Civil Rights Project and Penn State are releasing a new report, have released a new report on the state of school segregation. It is dispiriting, to say the least. Uh, schools are more segregated today than they were 25 years ago, um, and there is not much hope on that horizon. Uh, you can look across the Bay Area and you see this, there's, uh, many of you have probably followed what's happened to you know, there's like a handful of black students who are actually admitted um, to the schools in New York, the elite schools in New York City. But let's talk about segregation, residential segregation in the Bay Area. Now, um, to follow up on my promise to be a little bit of a gadfly, I want to make two, 
two controversial hot takes. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the vernacular of sports radio or sports, uh, a hot take is a take that is both um, true but also controversial and polemical. So um, the first thing I want to say is that most advocates are stuck in a 1960s or 70s view of segregation. Um, the second is that, well, I'll get to the second, but most of us understand and we're seeing that segregation is morphing and changing in the Bay Area, that there's a lot of displacement, that um, what Alex Schaffrin calls the resegregation of the Bay Area, I have a little nitpick with that phrase because I don't think we were ever integrated in the first place, so it's not really resegregation. Um, but one of the things that people think about, so if you were to think right now in your mind, what's a segregated neighborhood in the Bay Area? Just imagine, now you come from all nine counties, just imagine a county that you think is like the archetypal segregated neighborhood. What I wanna suggest though is that the most segregated neighborhoods in the Bay Area are not East Oakland, West Oakland, Bayview Hunters Point, pa East Palo Alto, they're actually affluent white neighborhoods. Uh, whites are actually the most segregated racial subgroup in the Bay Area. Now there's a power asymmetry, right? Like the conditions in, in non-white segregated neighborhoods are obviously very different than those in white segregated neighborhoods. But segregation is not just about people of color, uh, it's also about white people. If, if that weren't true, then why were there white schools in the Jim Crow South, right? Those were just as segregated as the black schools. Um, okay. Um, the second point I want to I want to make is that we have this narrative that segregation has kind of gone away, that it's kind of diminished, and that things have gotten better. And I want to I want to show you that this is just not true. The name of this this meeting is the Opportunity Summit, right? So I want to be really clear about something. Segregation is not about separating people; it's about separating people from opportunity. I'm going to say that again. Segregation is not about separating people. It's about separating people from opportunity. And the, the way in which you separate people from opportunity is you separate people. So the separation of people is the tactic by which you separate people from opportunity. It's what Charles Tilley calls opportunity hoarding. Um, and segregation, so there are lots of ways in which we enact segregation today, and I'm going to show you a bunch of maps in just a second. But the main way in which we do that is we have municipal boundaries or school district boundaries. Those boundaries are conduits for hoarding resources. That's why they exist. To me, Kelly Williams Buller, maybe many of you might remember her story, she's the parent in Ohio who went to jail for putting her children into a school in which they didn't live, school district in which they didn't live. She, to me, is a Linda Brown of the 21st century. And I think 50 years from now, we'll regard her as such. Okay, so I'm going to move through some data, and I'm going to show you some maps, and then I'll, we'll open it up for questions. So it's hard for me to see the, the, um, the screen back there, but there are a number of ways to measure segregation, and they can seem really boring, but they're actually very important. The most popular way to measure segregation, which is in the, um, not the Bay Area equity, actually in one of the Bay Area equity and atlases, the policy link releases, but also their national, is the dissimilarity index. And the, the dissimilarity index measures spread. It, me, it measures how even regions and metropolitan areas are. And the basic idea is how many people would have to move to create an integrated region or an integrated community or an integrated neighborhood, okay? And it's basically, it goes from zero to one or zero to 100, and the higher the score, the more segregated the region. Let me show you, so nationally, just so you have a sense of this, Black-white dissimilarity is 59 as of 2010, or 0.59, which means that about 60% of whites or blacks would have to move in order to create an integrated society. So the Kerner Commission's warning, by the way, in 1968 has come true. We actually live in a separate, unequal society. Let me show you, so this is dissimilarity scores, black-white dissimilarity scores nationally from 1940 to 2010. Um, basically what it shows is that the similarity scores have fallen substantially since the enactment of the Fair Housing Act. But there's two things I want to point out. The first is that notice that the similarity scores actually were rising in the middle and first half of the 20th century. There's a narrative we have that segregation is a legacy of the post-bellum period, a 19th century phenomenon. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you look at northern cities in 1900, whether you're looking at Philadelphia or St. Louis or Chicago or Boston, 
or even southern cities, they're not racially segregated by residents. And the reason is because you didn't have to be in the South, right? I mean, the South had, was so racially segregated in terms of railway cars, restaurants, churches, and so on, that residential segregation was basically redundant. And the North had about 15, 10 to 15% African American population across the, the North in, in the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, that really wasn't that segregated. There were black districts, black, black neighborhoods, but it was not a segregated society. Segregation, those of you who've maybe read Richard Rothstein's Color of Law, was really put into place in the middle of the 20th century. It was, it was institutionalized through both federal but also local and state policies. And this graph shows this. Now, the second thing I wanna point out about this, I'm gonna have to move more quickly, so I'm gonna talk faster, so I hope you can understand, is that the level of segregation, even though it's declined, is still incredibly high. Incredibly high at, at 59, okay? Now I'm gonna come back to that. So here's the dissimilarity index for the Bay Area. We're gonna actually launch this report at the end of the month. I think it's May 29th, part three. They'll, they'll have all these charts. So if you wanna get a copy of this, you'll be able to look that up. There's a couple of things I wanna point out. First is that black-white dissimilarity, like nationally, has declined. And for the nine-county Bay Area region, it's basically as segregated as the country. The, the black-white dissimilarity score is 0.57, which is just a shade off of 0.59. So black-white dissimilarity in the Bay Area is essentially where it is nationally. But he, here's the, here are the two things I want to point out. First, look at white, Latino, or Latinx segregation. It's gone up significantly since 1970. In fact, it's, it's kind of risen substantially. Also, and this is really interesting, at least to me, and kind of a little bit counterintuitive, white Asian segregation has increased non-trivially in the last 20 to 30 years. So white, Latino, white, Asian segregation in the Bay Area has increased over the last 30 to 40 years. Okay, so I'm gonna show you another measure of segregation. This is called the exposure index. And there's a lot of text on this slide, but let me just basically explain it. Exposure index tries to look at the average neighborhood of a member of a racial group. So what does the average neighborhood look like for any, any given member of a racial group? This is a national, exposure index trend line. And what it basically shows you is that the average African-American neighborhood, um, sorry, the average African-American neighborhood um, is 35% uh, is, is 30, is white, yeah, sorry, 35% African-American in 1940, 1950, and that's the exact same place it is today in 2010. So African-American neighborhoods, according to the exposure index, are as segregated today as they were in 1940. Let me show you this in terms of um, the Bay Area. What the isolation index and the isolation and exposure index are actually the flip side of each other, show you essentially the same thing that the dissimilarity scores do, which is that um, Asian and Latino segregation are increasing, in some cases pretty substantially, while African-American segregation, according to this, has declined, but is still at extremely high level. Okay, now, um, I can't actually read this slide, so let me see what this one is about. Okay, there are about 1,500 census tracts in the Bay Area, right? And um, one of the paradoxes of the Bay Area is that Bay Area is incredibly diverse, but it's also segregated. So what that means is that you can have neighborhoods that are, that are diverse and segregated or diverse and integrated. The large metropolitan areas in the Bay Area, like Oakland, San Jose, San Francisco, are incredibly diverse, but they're also incredibly segregated, as are places like Berkeley. So you have two forms of segregation. You have intra-municipal segregation, like between municipalities, and you have intra-municipal segregation, and both exist in the Bay Area. Um, now I'm gonna show you one more measure of segregation. It's called the Divergence Index. I actually think this is the best measure of segregation. It's developed by Elizabeth Roberto in 2015. And what it measures is how much does, a, does an area diverge from the racial demographics in the larger geographic context. And um, let me show you some, mat, some uh, charts, line charts, of divergence index in the Bay Area in specific counties. I hope you can see this. But the main point I wanna make is the top part of the table shows you the Bay Area divergence scores. Basically, anything between, I'm gonna be very rough here, anything between 0.1 and 0.2 divergence score is moderate segregation. Anything above 0.2 is high segregation. 
And what this shows is the Bay Area in 1970 had a score of 0.148. In 2010, it's 0.196. So it's on the verge of being, in its entirety, a highly segregated region. But the important point is that when you look at the divergence index, instead of those other indices I showed you, the Bay Area is more segregated today significantly than it was in 1970, which was the year that the Federal, the Federal Fair Housing Act went into effect. National Fair Housing Act was enacted in 1968, goes into effect January 1st, 1970. We're more segregated today than we were when the Fair Housing Act was passed and enacted and implemented. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. I've got all nine counties listed here, again, with the caveat, I think the Bay Area is now a 12-county region. Um, seven of the nine counties are more segregated today than they were in 1970. And the only two that aren't are Alameda County and San Francisco. And they're only slightly less segregated than they were in 1970. So the Bay Area as a whole is more segregated and most of the counties are more segregated. Now here's one other point about this, this slide. Most of the counties are significantly more segregated today than they were in 1970. Some of them have tripled the level of segregation and one of them has even quintupled the level of segregation. So this isn't just a bad trend line, it's a terrible trend line. Um, that's actually what that says. Okay, so I've got a chart here that shows you all the different indices, and I'm not going to linger on this, but I do want to show you, let's see, so we're in Santa Clara County, so I wanted to um, show you the multiple indices chart. Looking in, at the divergence score, so for Santa Clara County, the divergence index score in 1970 is .065, which would be actually integrated. Now look at it today, 0 0.2036, highly segregated. So it's tripled. The level of segregation in Santa Clara County has tripled um, in 40 years, and it's gone from integrated to highly segregated. <laughs> okay, um, this is one of my pet peeves. But racial demographics is not racial segregation. Racial, de they just aren't, and yet, Nine times out of 10, if you look at a so-called segregation map, what you're actually looking at is a demographic map. So let me show you some examples of that. This is a wonderful report by Urban Habitat called Race, Inequality, and the Resegregation of the Bay Area. Every single map in that report is actually a demographic map. So it's showing basically where are people being displaced, where's the increase or decrease in certain racial subgroups or dem demographic populations. That is not a segregation map, it's a demographic map. Here's the report that we, this is the uh, Urban Displacement Project report. Um, also in, in the title, segregation. None of the maps in the report are actually segregation maps. They're demographic maps for the same reason I just mentioned. Um, this is a book by Jessica Trunstein called Segregation by Design. There's about six to 12 books on segregation that have come out in the last year. Most of them are phenomenal. This is one of the charts or maps in the book. Again, this is a demographic map. as percentage non-white or percentage black, I think, here. This is a demographic map. It's not a segregation map. Um, I mentioned this book earlier by Alex Shaffron. Can't recommend it enough. Um, but his maps in there, which purport to show segregation, are demographic maps. Um, this is the report that I mentioned earlier that we co-wrote with, Rise, uh, with uh, Insight Center for Rise Together a couple of years ago. Um, we produced this map. This is not a segregation map. This is a demographic map. So I'm uh, calling myself out here as well. Um, this is a, a wonderful map that was created by a, a trio of geographers at three different universities. This actually is not a segregation map either. It's a diversity map. But it uses the entropy index, which is frequently a substitute for segregation. Entropy is not a measure of segregation. OK, so we decided to map segregation. And to my knowledge, we're the first organization that actually mapped segregation itself and published the, that, that re, those results for the Bay Area. And so I, I kind of gave, gave you the rough breakdowns. We took the entire Bay Area and we looked at every census tract and we gave it a divergence index score. And then we broke it down into high, moderate, or low. And this is what we got. And as Sarah mentioned, 40% of the Bay Area is white. Got it. So I'm just gonna move through some of these maps quickly. Um, so this is, I wanted to show you the, uh, this is the Alameda map. We're doing two things here. Every census tract is scored as being highly moderate or low segregation. But we're doing something else. We're drawing a line around our border, uh, around some of the census tracts that have intense racial concentrations. So the, the pie chart in the corner of the map 
is the demographic breakdown by color. So you can see that in Alameda County, whites are 31% of the population, right? Yet look at these uh, census tracts in eastern Alameda County. Those are shaded by yellow, which means they're 75% they're white or more in a county that is 31% white. And then we did a similar thing for other racial subgroups. So you can see in East and West Oakland, the um, census tracts that are shaded in purple are census tracts that are over 50% African American in a county that's only, was it, 10% African American. And the, in the census tracts that are shaded in red are census tracts that are over 65% Latinx, even though the county is only 22.5% Latinx. And so we did the same thing for every county in the Bay Area. I'll show you one more here, which is Santa Clara County, I believe. And you can see the level of segregation. We can also actually get the divergence index score for racial subgroups. The most segregated neighborhood for Latinx, Latinos, Hispanics in the entire Bay Area is actually Gilroy. Um, the most five of the top 10 most segregated neighborhoods for African Americans are in Alameda County. Um, I actually have some more data. So you can see all these maps and some of our demographic charts uh, at our, uh, our website here, our webpage, Racial Segregation in the Bay Area. I only have one minute, but I was going to, I was going to leave this for Q&A, but I want to show you a, a couple of demographic charts because Sarah mentioned them during her talk. So in part two, what we did was we created histograms and line charts that showed the evolution of racial demographic change in the Bay Area for Asian Americans, African, Amer African Americans, whites, Latinx, and Native Americans. And I applaud them for disaggregating Asian. It's extremely hard, it's an extremely heterogeneous group, yet we actually don't, census just doesn't collect the different Asian uh, demographic subgroups. We've talked with Anne about that as well. It's hard to get. But a couple things I want to point out. So uh, Sarah mentioned this. Look at the absolute and relative changes in the African American population in the Bay Area. Right? The African American population peaked in 1990 at over around almost 550,000 people. Now it's at 460,000 people. Despite the fact the Bay Area population has inc in continued to increase decade after decade. So not only, has, not only has the African American population declined in relative terms, it's declined substantially in absolute terms. Um, okay, I've been told to stop, but I wanna show you, just, just show you <laughs> these uh, other line charts. So um, this is the, the uh, sorry, ignore the top line header, it's the Asian, this, there's a slide problem here, Asian population. Asian population ha has gone through different um, demographic changes, obviously the um, the post-1965 Immigration Act has opened the doors to a lot of Southeast Asians to, to move to the United States. Um, but there have been different uh, waves of immigration. Uh, obviously, Asian population in the Bay Area has gone through uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment, um, so on and so forth. But you can actually see that the Asian population uh, is on track, potentially, given this kind of enormous slope, to become the plurality racial subgroup in the Bay Area within a decade or two. Actually exceed that of whites. Um, and I have the white thing here, if I can, the clicker will work. <laughs> so you can see the white population in both absolute and relative terms as well. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much for your time and uh, check this out. Thank you. If you have questions, please raise up your index cards. Okay, I see some hands. Set of hands. Great, thank you. We have folks coming around to grab the cards. Um, so let's start, start with a question. Thank you both for your presentations. Um, hearing um, the conversation about um, the way change is happening over time, both in absolute and in relative numbers, what, what conclusions do you draw about what that means? change and we do have the in the Bay Area we do our projections for counties so you can see into the future you know what does it, what is it going to look like in uh, 2050 um, 
I mean, I think when it comes to the displacement of the black population, I think that we need to work on how do we keep people and have explicit strategies to keep people here and to bring people back, to bring people back to the cities where their families are, right? In Oakland and San Francisco, people are very concerned that their, their children and their grandchildren cannot live near them. Um, so I think you need explicit strategies there. I think that's, that some of demographic change just has to do with the age structure of the population and the decline in the white population is about, well, the, the baby boomers are aging, they're retiring, and we need to think about, well, what does that mean for the current workforce, which is much, much more diverse, and we know because of our racial inequities in our region um, is, you know, not, we need specific targeted interventions to ensure that people uh, can connect to jobs, to good jobs, and we need to um, implement strategies to ensure they are good jobs in terms of wage strategies, in terms of business models. So that's, that's how I start to think about it. Um, I'll pass it to Stephen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to weave my answer into the questions just so we can get more, more questions in. OK. So what does racial segregation look like if you control for class? It's a great question. So Sean Reardon at Stanford has published some interesting work in the last couple of years showing that economic segregation has increased dramatically in the last 40 years. So the, the, the narrative out there is that racial segregation has declined, but economic segregation has increased. And one of the points he makes is that in 1972, about 60% of neighborhoods in the country were middle class, um, and the rest were either affluent or poor. Today, only about 40% of neighborhoods are middle class, and the rest are affluent or poor. So what that suggests is that you have intensified neighborhood stratification, meaning that across the country, you have more layers of strata. It's called the T-bout mechanism, which is this idea that people will sort themselves by income into a kind of mix of neighborhoods and services that they can afford. And they'll go to like the best that they can possibly afford. That's terrible news for us. <laughs> because it means that resources are gonna agglomerate in such a way that they'll only be able to be provided to people who can afford them. Um, now, what I've tried to show you is that economic segregation, you know, yes, economic segregation has gotten worse, but so has racial segregation. This narrative that segregation has improved, racial segregation has improved is just not true, um, at least not in the aggregate. Um, to answer the first question, I like to think of the Bay Area as Detroit circa 1940. Detroit circa 1940 was, you know, the motor city. It was the engine for, economic engine for the country. And you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people moving to Detroit from all over the country, including as part of the Great Migration, right? That is what the Bay Area is. It's the economic engine for the country. And in Detroit in 1940, between 1950 and 1955 in Detroit, you had horrible overcrowding in terms of housing. You had people, especially African Americans, who were not, not permitted to move into white neighborhoods. You had overcrowding that was, caused price premiums in black neighborhoods to be extremely high. So I think if we think of, if, now look at Detroit today, right? I think if we think of the Bay Area as Detroit in 1940, 1945, it begins to help us re think differently about the kinds of policies that we need to make sure this, this is an equitable place in terms, of, in terms of employment, in terms of housing, in terms of health, in terms of everything. Great. Yeah, yeah, just add to add on to that, I mean, I think that it is, this is something that we talk a lot about at PolicyLink in terms of racial segregation versus economic segregation and what matters because I think that we have to be careful in our framing of the issue uh, because you know communities that are Latinx communities or black communities are not bad that they're you know racially um, you know th those it's it could be fine <laughs> um, as long as there is economic diversity in those communities and people are able to connect to opportunity so I think that we just um, want to always bring in that issue around economics and it's not just about race because there's nothing necessarily in and of itself wrong. Many of you have probably heard Anna, Angela Glover Blackwell, um, our founder, talk about her neighborhood which was segregated racially, a black community in St. Louis, but it was not economically segregated. There were middle class black people living in her neighborhood. And so I think we just, it's useful to bring in that lens. Yeah, segregation I think is a complicated concept, including for some of the reasons you looked at when you were looking at 
distribution of elected officials, right? Um, so the data looks like was collected um, up to 2010. What do you think is happening now, almost 10 years later? Well, we continue to collect data. The problem is that we can't use decennial census. So we use ACS, which is just a sample, and is, it's really hard to get statistically significant ACS data at the census track level. So um, in terms of what I think is gonna happen with some of the segregation measures, I think they're going to be, in some cases, worse, in some cases, a little bit better, in some cases, basically the same. My guess is that the national dissimilarity score, black-white dissimilarity score, will edge down a tiny bit after the 2020 census. That is that we'll probably, it'll probably be in line with basically what the Bay Area score is now, probably somewhere between 0.55 and 0.57 is my best guess. Um, but we're st look, white, Latino segregation, white, Asian segregation are getting worse, but white, black segregation is still the highest level. So even though white, Latino segregation is on a steep upward increase, White black segregation is still the highest overall level and it's still the worst phenomenon of segregation. Okay, I'm gonna take you to another one. What roles has mass, incarcera mass incarceration played in the increase of segregation, particularly as it relates to black and brown people and the over-policing of communities? Well, we could spend the whole day talking about this, this subject, but it plays an enormously important role. Um, first of all, uh, mass incarceration takes breadwinners out of communities, takes taxpayers out of communities, and therefore it takes incomes out of communities. And the result is not just what happens in that household, it's what happens in that neighborhood, in that community. You lose coaches, you lose uh, father figures, you lose um, uh, uncles and, 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 and mothers and, and aunts. Um, the second thing, there's a, uh, there's a phenomenon called prison gerrymandering. Have you, raise your hand if you've heard of this. This is basically the phenomenon. So, so obviously there are entrenched groups that like prisons, like, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a workforce development plan for rural white, uh, you know, guards and so on and so forth. But there's another phenomenon, which is that um, for census purposes, prisoners count as residing in the neighborhood in which they are imprisoned, the census tract in which they're imprisoned, not where they were lived before they were incarcerated. And so uh, you can basically look and see, so imagine a rural county that has a population of a couple hundred white people and has several thousand uh, African Americans or non-whites, right? That creates enormous political power in terms of apportionment for the, that community, and that happens all over the country. In fact, there was a study done in New York State that found that every single uh, electoral district in the state of New York was affected by prison gerrymandering. So um, there are multiple negative effects of mass incarceration, um, the least of which is a political uh, apportionment, but it, it gives tremendous political power uh, to white communities that don't really deserve it. That's one reason, by the way, I support uh, the policies that, have, that two states have, which is let prisoners vote. Okay, I have another one. This one's on schools. Um, so there's been an increase in privatization and in charter schools that has exasperated um, in segregation in our, in our neighborhoods and schools. Has your research shown this? Um, and um, how has the opening and closing of schools in low-income neighborhoods um, impacted uh, fracturing of community? And I'll go to the next question after that. Okay. We've got uh, a long one on Again, this one. we could spend all day on school segregation and charter schools. Um, I personally am not a big fan of charter schools. Um, I know that there are a lot of non-white parents who like charter schools. One of the things that charter schools do that's very clever is they market themselves to families of color and communities of color and you, you avoid microaggression and racism and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, number one, they're divesting public schools of resources. And number two, they're more segregated on average than the public schools. Um, in terms of school, school closings and school openings, you know, we do so much work to try and integrate schools through attendance zone policies, magnet school policies, so on and so forth. The number one thing we can do to, to diversify schools is where do we put a school in the first place? If you put a school in a spot where its catchment zone covers a diverse area, you're going to create integrated schools. So I always say, like, where you open a school and where you close a school is by far the most important thing that you can do. Now, one of the political power dynamics is that, you know, the schools that are predominantly non-white are usually targeted for closure first. That is bad policy, just bad policy. 
what you need to figure out is what are the diversifying, what are the diversity effects of the school site? That should be the primary thing you do. Okay, great. Now we have just a few minutes. I'm going to go through a bunch of questions that are about the, the tools themselves that people have. So Sarah, the first couple are for you. Um, great news that there's data now on, on elected officials. Any plans to add staff in local government and regional government agencies? Yeah, we would love to expand it. Right now we started with the council members and mayors and county elected officials, right? So we just started with a few categories, but we do aspire, now that we know how to do it, um, we, we do aspire to increase that and we would love to capture the data on boards and commissions. I know many of you are working on that, so hopefully in the future. And does the Equity Atlas drill down by county? Yes, it does. We have data on the, each of the nine counties in the Bay Area and then also 40 sub-county areas and then the cities and, and census-designated places. Great. And then for each of you, there are many now many more biracial couples and families. Um, how are they accounted for in this data? Biracial. Oh, Multiracial. Oh, biracial. Multi um, we have, yeah, I mean, there's a census, cat we, we generally rely on the census categories, and there are, um, oh, I guess that's individual. Did, is it biracial households that they asked about? Uh, they asked about uh, marriages and families, <laughs> but I think they're probably trying to figure out how, how does multiracial identity fit in. Right, right. So I think, you know, in the, it's, we use the census categories based on self-identification, so you're marking multiple races. Um, for individuals and then for households, it is the head of household, which, you know, so it's whoever designates themselves as the head of household. So you would need to get to the individual microdata to be able to look at the composition of those households. Raise your hand in the audience if someone in your extended family is a different race than you. Okay, almost everyone raised their hand. Uh, multiracial. Uh, Individuals and groups are the fastest growing group in the United States. It's very difficult to try and figure that out in terms of the census data for the reasons that Sarah just said. It's something we have to grapple with though. We have to figure that out. Um, in our racial segregation and demographic maps, as I said, we looked at five racial subgroups. There is a group called other. I hate the word other. It's othering. Um, but that's typically where that, that falls in terms of census. Okay, keep, keep the mic, another, another one for you. Um, why are the highlights by race tracks on the diversity map set at different thresholds? For example, white tracks are 75%, um, but black tracks are, are just 50%. We just, try, look, we tried to develop the maps such that things, particular racial concentrations stood out, and we just calibrated the concentration levels so that you would see some census tracks shaded but it wouldn't be a blizzard of, of images. We wanted certain to pop out. So uh, basically what we did is we, we set the thresholds, we calibrated the thresholds such that if there was a, basically 30% or more deviation from the demographics in the, in the, in the Bay Area as a whole, then we circled, we circled those census tracts. So it's basically whatever the, the subgroup uh, representation is plus 30%, roughly. And, and will you both be updating this data after the 2020 census? Yes. Okay, and last one. Um, if segregation is not just about ethnicity, what does diverse and integrated look like? Well, I think it's a great question. Look, diverse and integrated would be, imagine Oakland, if the schools were as diverse as the neighborhoods, right? Oakland is an incredibly diverse place, one of the most diverse in the country, right? Basically 25% of each racial subgroup. Yet the neighborhoods are incredibly segregated. You have the white neighborhoods, the African-American neighborhoods, the Latino neighborhoods, the Asian neighborhoods. What if the city was actually, as, in the neighborhoods in the city, were as diverse as the city itself? That is what an integrated community would look like. Comments? No? Okay, well thank you. We're gonna close it out right here. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>